the strategic position. The following factors were decisive in determining the strategic position in the Polish campaign. First, the superiority of the German forces, provided that the German leadership were prepared to accept a considerable risk in the West in order to commit the bulk of its strength against Poland. Secondly, the geographical situation, which enabled the Germans to take the Polish army in a pincer movement from East Prussia on one flank and Silesia and Slovakia on the other. Thirdly, the latent threat present in Poland's rear from the outset in the form of the Soviet Union. German order of battle and plan of operations. The German planners accepted the above-mentioned risk in the West to the full. OKH launched its attack against Poland with 42 divisions of regular troops, including one newly formed armoured division, 10 panzer, and one new infantry division formed from fortress troops in the Oda Wata Basin the 50th. They consisted of 24 infantry divisions, 3 mountain divisions, 6 armoured divisions, 4 light divisions, 4 motorised infantry divisions, and 1 cavalry brigade. Then came 16 new divisions, not formed until after the general mobilisation and destined for use between the second and fourth waves. These could not initially be regarded as first-rate troops. Also assigned for the Polish campaign were the SS division Leibstandard Adolf Hitler and one or two reinforced SS regiments. For the West, this left only 11 regular divisions some fortress troops amounting to about a division in strength later to be formed into 72 infantry division and 35 newly constituted divisions of 2nd to 4th line troops. No armoured or motorised troops were available. There was thus a total of 46 divisions, of which only three quarters were conditionally fit to go into action. 22. Infantry division, which had been trained and equipped as an airborne division, was retained at the disposal of OKH in the interior of the Reich. The bulk of our air forces were likewise committed against Poland in the form of two air fleets, a third, weaker one, being kept in the west. The risks which the German leadership ran by, distributing its forces in this way, were undoubtedly very great indeed. Because of the unexpected brevity of the Polish campaign, a development due in part to the loser's own mistakes, and, above all, as a result of the complete inaction of Poland's Western allies at the time of her defeat, these risks have hardly ever been properly appreciated. It should be realised that at that particular juncture, the German command had to reckon with a French army some 90 divisions strong. In autumn 1939, according to V. Tippelskirsch, France actually raised 108 divisions in the space of three weeks. These consisted of 57 infantry, 5 cavalry, 1 armoured and 45 reservist or territorial divisions, supported by strong army troops of tanks and artillery. It should be noted, however, that part of these forces remained in North Africa and on the Alpine frontier in the initial stages. The last category had the advantage of being made up of fully trained reservists, whereas the new German formations consisted to a great extent of raw recruits or reservists from the First World War. There can be no doubt, then, that the French army far outnumbered Germany's forces in the West from the very first day. The British contribution of land forces, on the other hand, was quite insignificant. It amounted to a mere four divisions, and even these did not arrive until the first half of October. The basis of the German plan of operations against Poland was to make maximum use of the way the frontier ran in order to envelop the enemy from the start. Thus, the German armies deployed in two widely divided flank groups which left the central sector, the oder Water Basin, almost wide open. Northern Army Group Commander Colonel General Wiesbock Chief of Staff, General V. Salmuth, comprised two armies embracing a total of five infantry and one armoured corps. Under command of these were nine regular infantry divisions, including the newly formed 50 Infantry Division, which consisted of fortress troops and was not up to strength, eight infantry divisions established on mobilisation, two armoured divisions plus the newly formed tank task force Kemp, two motorised infantry divisions and one cavalry brigade, 
in all 21 divisions. Supplementing these in East Prussia were the fortress troops of Königsberg and Lotze, in Pomerania, the Netze Brigade. Of this army group, 3rd Army General vs. Kuchler deployed in East Prussia and 4th Army Colonel General vs. Klug in East Pomerania. The task of the army group was to thrust through the Polish corridor, to throw the mass of its forces on the east of the Vistula towards the southeast or south, and then, after forcing the Naru line, to take any Polish defence of the Vistula from the rear. Southern Army Group Commander Colonel General vs. Rundstedt, Chief of Staff General vs. Manstein, was considerably stronger. It consisted of three armies, 14th Colonel General List, 10th Colonel General vs. Reichenau, and 8th Colonel General Blaskowitz. In all, the army group had eight infantry and four armoured corps, totalling 15 regular infantry divisions, three mountain divisions, eight newly drafted divisions, and the bulk of the mechanised formations, four armoured, four light, and two motorised infantry divisions. This made a total of 36 divisions. The army group deployed 14th Army in the Upper Silesian Industrial Region, Eastern Moravia, and Western Slovakia. 10th Army in Upper Silesia around and to the south of Kreuzberg, and 8th Army in Central Silesia, eastward of Oles. Its task was to defeat the enemy in the large bend of the Vistula and in Galicia, to dash for Warsaw with strong motorized forces, taking the Vistula crossings as fast as possible on a broad front, and then, in conjunction with Northern Army Group, to destroy the remainder of the Polish army. Polish order of battle and plan of operations. Peacetime Poland had 30 infantry divisions, 11 cavalry brigades, one mountain brigade and two motorised armoured brigades. In addition to these, there were a few frontier corps regiments, a large number of home defence ON battalions and naval troops stationed in the Dinya Hell area. In other words, her aggregate strength was pretty considerable. Her weapons, however, dated mainly from World War I, and her air force of some 1,000 aircraft was also not up to modern standards. Germany had expected Poland to double the number of her divisions in the event of war, though it seemed doubtful whether the requisite arms were available. According to Via Tippelkirch in his History of the Second World War, Poland drafted only enough regiments for ten reserve divisions prior to the outbreak of hostilities, and even then she apparently had no time to embody all of them in their scheduled divisions. Nevertheless, German intelligence did identify a number of reserve divisions in the course of the campaign. The Polish High Command disposed its forces as follows. Deployed along the East Prussian frontier, in front of the Boba Nareo Vistula line, were a combat group of two divisions and two cavalry brigades between Suwalki and Tomza, and the Maudlin army of four divisions and two cavalry brigades on both sides of Malawa. In the corridor was the Pomorza army of five divisions and one cavalry brigade. Facing the German frontier from the Wata to the Slovakian frontier were three armies, the Poznan army, with a strength of four divisions and two cavalry brigades, in the western part of Poznan province, the Lodz army four divisions and two cavalry brigades, around Wielun, and the Krakow Army six divisions, one cavalry and one motorised brigade, between Chestochowa and Noe Targ. Behind the two last-named armies was the Prussia Army six divisions and one cavalry brigade in the area tomasov kielce Finally, the deep flank along the Carpathian frontier was to be covered by a Carpathian army, composed mainly of reserve units and ON battalions, in echelon formation. A reserve group General Piskor's army, consisting of three divisions and one motorised brigade, remained on the Vistula in the area Modlin, Warsaw, Lublin. In the course of the campaign, moreover, an independent policy group was formed east of the Bug, presumably for protection against Russia. In the event, the Polish deployment was still in progress when the German invasion started, and for this reason, it was probably never properly completed in the form described above. Some Reflections on the Polish Deployment It is difficult to decide the strategic aim of the Polish deployment, 
unless it was based on a wish to cover everything and surrender nothing voluntarily. It was a policy that usually leads to the defeat of the weaker party. Hitler was to have a similar experience only a few years later, without ever learning his lesson from it. Now, the difficulty of Poland's strategic position was really quite obvious, consisting as it did in the inferiority of the Polish forces, and the fact that the line of the frontier enabled Germany to attack from two, later even from three, sides at once. So, when the Polish high command still could not resist trying to hold on to everything, this only went to show how difficult it is to reconcile psychological and political inhibitions with hard military fact. Apart from Marshal Pilsudski and one or two sober-minded politicians, probably no one in Poland ever quite realised in what a dangerous situation the country had landed itself by enforcing its unjustified territorial demands on the neighbouring states of Russia and Germany. Yet this same Poland numbered only 35 million inhabitants, of whom a mere 22 million were of Polish nationality. Director of the Polish Military Academy, in a memorandum he submitted to Marshal Ride Smigli at the beginning of 1938. He insisted that there could be no question of giving up Poland's vital strategic zone, which embraced both the industrial regions of Lodz and Upper Silesia and the valuable agricultural areas of Poznan, Kutno and Kielce. Accordingly, he proposed a deployment plan which, while dropping any attempt to hold the Corridor or Poznan province, substantially resembled the one ultimately implemented in 1939. To buttress the Polish defences, a far-reaching system of fortifications was to be built south of the East Prussian frontier, in a wide arc from Grudziads to Poznan, and along the Silesian frontier from Ostrowo through Czestochowa to Cieszyn. At the same time, General Kutrzeba pointed out, attention should be paid to preparing sally ports for later attacks against both East and West Prussia and Silesia. That to build such far-flung fortifications in adequate strength would have exceeded Polish potentialities was only too clear. Nevertheless, General Kutzeba had recognised Poland's military inferiority vis-à-vis -vis the Reich. His appraisal of French support was equally clear-sighted, since he took it for granted that, even if France rendered the maximum military assistance, Poland would be thrown on her own resources for the first six or eight weeks. He therefore envisaged a strategic defence along the western periphery of the above-mentioned vital zone, in the interior of which reserves were to assemble for the decisive operations later on. As I have said, the deployment carried out by the Polish army in 1939 was very similar to that recommended by the general. The latter, however, had envisaged making the main effort in the area torun bydgoszcz Gniezno, whereas in 1939 there tended to be two focal points, one in the area around East Prussia and the other opposite Silesia. The Polish deployment of 1939 aimed, as it was, at covering everything, including the forward province of Poznan, was bound to bring defeat in view of the Germans' superiority and their ability to outflank. How, then, should Poland have operated to avoid such a defeat? The first question to settle was whether the vital strategic zone referred to by General Kutuzeba was to be lost by itself, or as a result of a German envelopment from East Prussia, Silesia and Slovakia, together with the Polish army. It was the same sort of question as I kept asking Hitler in the years 1943-4, every time he called on me to hold the Donitz Basin, the Dnieper and other areas of Russia. To my mind, the answer to Poland's problem was perfectly clear. As far as her high command was concerned, Everything must hinge on the Polish army's ability to hold out at all costs until an offensive by the Western powers compelled the Germans to withdraw the mass of their forces from the Polish theatre. Even though the loss of the industrial areas would appear on the face of it to render Poland incapable of fighting a war of any length, the army's continued existence as a combat force would still have held out the prospect of winning them back. Whatever happened, the Polish army must not allow itself to be encircled to the west or on both sides of the Vistula. The whole crux of Poland's problem was to play for time. 
obviously no decisive defence could be contemplated anywhere forward of the Boba-Naro-Vistula line, although it might be possible on the southern flank to move this front up as far as the Dunajek, with a view to holding on to the central Polish industrial area between the Vistula and the San. The most important thing of all would have been to eliminate any possibility of encirclement by the Germans from East Prussia and Western Slovakia. A means of doing so in the north was offered by the line of the Bobernaro and the Vistula down as far as the fortress of Modlin or Weisograd. This, at any rate, formed a strong natural obstacle and additional support was afforded by the former Russian fortifications, obsolete though they were. A further point was that if any German armour at all appeared from East Prussia, it was unlikely to be in great strength. The problem in the south was to obviate an outflanking manoeuvre deep in Poland's rear by defending the Carpathian passes. Both tasks could undoubtedly have been fulfilled with limited forces. To deploy the Polish forces forward of the Bobonaro line was just as big a blunder as pushing strong forces out into the corridor and the bulge of Poznan province. Once the necessary guarantees had been created against such deep outflanking in the north and south, it would have been possible to fight a delaying action in the west of Poland, always bearing in mind that the main German thrust was to be expected from Silesia. One reason for this was that the rail and road network in that part of the world allowed a quicker concentration of powerful forces than could be affected in Pomerania or, for that matter, East Prussia. The other was that a drive on Warsaw via Poznan, being purely frontal, would have been operationally the least effective, and was therefore improbable. The Polish assembly of forces should not have taken place in the vicinity of the frontier, as happened in 1939 but far enough back for the defenders to identify the main direction of the German thrusts. This would have meant managing with a bare minimum of forces in the corridor and the Poznan area in order to oppose the main thrust from Silesia in the greatest possible strength and, above all, to keep an adequate strategic reserve in hand. Had Poland concentrated on improving the former German fortifications on the Vistula between Torun and Grudziads, Instead of so long indulging in dreams of aggression, she could at least have delayed the link-up of the German forces advancing from Pomerania and East Prussia. Similarly, by properly fortifying Poznan, she could have curtailed the Germans' freedom of movement in that province. One further point is that the idea of utilising the inner defence line to deal counter-blows in the north or south of western Poland, according to the way the situation developed, would hardly have worked out in practice there was insufficient space available for operations of this sort, and the Polish railway network would not have stood the strain. Besides, the possibility had to be borne in mind that big troop movements would very soon have been hampered by the Germans' air forces and tank formations. Consequently, there was nothing for it but to plan the really decisive defence as far back as the Bobonareo Vistula San or Dunajek line, and merely to fight for time anywhere forward of this always remembering that one had to place the main effort opposite Silesia from the very start and simultaneously ensure due protection on the northern and southern flanks. No one can argue that any of these measures would have saved Poland from ultimate defeat if, as proved to be the case, she was abandoned to her fate by the West. Nevertheless, they would have saved the Poles being so easily overrun in their frontier areas as a result of which the Polish High Command was unable either to fight a set battle in the Vistula Bend or to withdraw its forces behind the great line of rivers and take up a prepared defence. From the very first day, Poland could only fight for time. All she could do was to hold out against German attacks, ultimately behind the river line, until an Allied offensive in the west compelled the Germans to pull back. It should therefore have been incumbent on the Polish military leaders to tell their government quite bluntly that they could not go to war against the Reich without a binding guarantee from the Western powers that the moment hostilities broke out, they would launch an offensive in the West with all the resources at their disposal. No government could have disregarded such a warning in view of the decisive influence wielded at the time by the Polish commander-in-chief, Marshal Rydz Smigli. The government ought to have come to terms on the Danzig and Corridor question while there was still time, 
if only to postpone a war with Germany. In 1940, our troops in France captured a letter dated 10th September 1939 from General Gamelin to the Polish military attaché in Paris. It was obviously a reply to an inquiry from the Poles as to when they could expect any effective military assistance. The comments made by Gamelin for onward transmission to Marshal Reed Smigley were as follows. More than half our regular divisions in the northeast are in action. Since we crossed the frontier, the Germans have been resisting energetically, despite which we have made some headway. However, we are tied down in a static war with an enemy well prepared for defence, and I have not yet all the necessary artillery. There has been aerial warfare from the outset, in conjunction with the operations on the ground, and we are conscious of having a considerable part of the Luftwaffe opposite us. I have thus fulfilled in advance my promise to start the offensive with my main forces a fortnight after the first day of the French mobilisation. It was impossible for me to do more. It follows from this that Poland did in fact have a guarantee from the French in her possession. The only question is whether the Polish High Command should have been satisfied with one which did not commit the French to start the offensive till a whole fortnight had elapsed. In any case, events have since shown that the above promise was meant to imply anything but swift and effective aid to Poland. Poland's defeat was the inevitable outcome of the Warsaw government's illusions about the action its allies would take as well as of its overestimation of the Polish army's ability to offer lengthy resistance. Poland's defeat was the inevitable outcome of the Warsaw government's illusions about the action its allies would take, as well as of its overestimation of the Polish army's ability to offer lengthy resistance. The operations of Southern Army Group When our troops crossed the Polish frontier at daybreak on 1 September 1939, we of the Army Group staff were naturally at our posts in the Monastery of the Holy Cross at Nese. This was a training establishment for Catholic missionaries situated outside the town and offered an ideal wartime setting for a senior headquarters staff by virtue of its size and seclusion and the unembellished state of its classrooms and cells. To a certain extent, the Spartan existence of its normal inmates, from whom we had taken over part of the building, reflected itself in our own standard of living, for though our camp commandant came from the famous Lohenbrau in Munich, he showed little inclination to pamper us. As a matter of course, we drew ordinary rations like any other troops, and the midday stews we got from the field kitchen certainly gave us no cause for complaint. On the other hand, I really cannot believe that the evening menu need have been limited day after day to army bread and hard-preserved sausage, which our older gentlemen had considerable difficulty in masticating. Fortunately, the monks helped out with occasional lettuces or vegetables from their kitchen garden. On a number of evenings, the army group commander and his senior staff were joined by the abbot, who retailed fascinating accounts of the self-sacrificing work of the missionaries in distant parts of the globe. This was a welcome distraction, however brief, from the burning problems which the immediate future presented. September 1st put an end to these talks, however. Henceforth, the battle claimed every moment of our time. The fact that we were in our offices so early that morning was due less to any practical necessity than to the feeling that we had to be in readiness from the very moment our troops made contact with the enemy. For it was certain that many hours would pass before we heard any vital news from the armies under our command. These were the hours familiar to anyone who has worked on a higher formation staff the phase in which events have already begun to take their course, and one can only await developments. The soldier at the front knows the tremendous tension that mounts before an attack as the platoon commander's watch ticks steadily onto the moment of release when the assault can go in. From then on, however, the frontline fighter is completely taken up with the battle around him and quite oblivious of anything else. The difference with a formation staff, and the higher one goes, the more this applies is that the moment of attack marks the beginning of a period of waiting that is charged with suspense and anxiety. Subordinate formations quite rightly dislike getting inquiries about the progress of a battle, which they are liable to interpret as a sign of nervousness. Consequently, it is better just to sit and wait. A point worth noting in this respect is that the saying about bad news travelling fast seldom applies in the military sphere. 
Whenever things are going well, news usually finds its way back quickly enough. If, on the other hand, the attack gets stuck, a blanket of silence descends on the front, either because communications have been cut or because those concerned prefer to hang on till they have something more encouraging to report. And so the tension breaks only when the first reports come in, whether these be good or bad. Pending their arrival, we too could only sit and wait. Would the troops on whom we had expended so much labour and effort, but whose training had been carried out far too quickly, come up to expectation? In particular, would the big armoured formations, the organisation and use of which constituted something completely new, justify the hopes of their creator, General Guderian, and ourselves? Would the German headquarters staffs, in particular our own army group, be able to master the opening situation and go on to win a complete victory that would destroy the enemy while he was still west of the Vistula and remove any danger of a war on two fronts? Such were the questions running through our minds in those hours of tension and uncertainty. The opening situation. It was envisaged in OKH's plan for a large-scale outflanking operation against the Polish army from East Prussia and Silesia. That northern army group, having once established a link between East Prussia and Pomerania by expelling the Polish forces from the corridor, would be able to get straight behind the Vistula in order to attack the main enemy forces in the large bend of the river from the rear. The task that must evolve on Southern Army Group, on the other hand, was to try to engage the enemy as far forward as the Vistula and to frustrate any attempt he might make to withdraw behind the line of the Vistula and San. This meant that 10th Army's tank formations, with its infantry divisions following as closely as possible behind, must make a concerted effort to overrun the enemy troop assemblies that would probably be taking place near the frontier, and that the tanks should, if possible, reach the Vistula crossings from Demblin to Warsaw, ahead of the enemy. It also presupposed that 14th Army, which was to advance through Galicia, would reach and cross the San with the greatest possible speed. In the event of the enemies intending to place his decisive resistance as far back as the San and Vistula, this army could immediately unhinge the river defences from the south and join up, deep in the enemy's rear, with the eastern wing of Northern Army Group as it approached from the north. 14th Army was bound to be assisted here by the fact that its right wing, by extending so far eastward into Slovakia, constituted an immediate threat to the deep flank of the enemy forces concentrating in the Krakow area and thereby made it impossible to effect any protracted defence of Galicia. Such was the course of action on which Southern Army Group based its operations in Poland. It strove throughout to engage and destroy the main body of the enemy forward of the Vistula, but at the same time remained ready to anticipate any attempt he might make to avoid accepting the decisive battle until he was behind the San Vistula line. Instead of giving a day-to-day -day account of the operations, useful though a detailed survey of this lightning campaign would undoubtedly be, I would rather confine myself to a broad outline of its essential phases. These partly in chronological sequence and partly simultaneous, were as follows. The heavy frontier battles fought by 14th Army in Galicia and the latter's subsequent pursuit of the beaten enemy to Lwów and over the San 10th Army's breakthrough to the Vistula and the Battle of the Radom Pocket. The Battle of the Bazura, which was conducted direct from HQ Southern Army Group and led to the destruction of the strongest enemy grouping by 8th and 10th Armies. The attack on Warsaw and the final battles which resulted from the frequent changes in the agreements entered into by Germany's political leaders with the Soviets, who were by now marching into eastern Poland. The latter crossed the Polish frontier on 17th September 1939. 14th Army's assault march through Galicia. The first object of 14th Army was to encircle the strong enemy forces believed to be in the area of Krakow. This encirclement was already inherent in the army's extensive deployment from Silesia through the region of Moravska Ostrava to the Carpathians. While 8 Corps, General Bush, 8 and 28 Infantry and 5 Panzer Divisions, 
was to break through the strong Polish frontier fortifications in eastern Upper Silesia and then advance on Krakow along the north of the Vistula, 17 Corps, General Kienitz, 7 and 44. Infantry divisions moved on Krakow to the south of the Vistula from Moravia. The task of directly outflanking the enemy forces thought to be around Krakow fell to two further army corps, 22 Panzer Corps, General Vers Kleist, two Panzer and four light divisions, which was to drive on Krakow from the south out of the Arava Valley in the western Carpathians, and 18 Mountain Corps, General Bayer, two and three mountain divisions, which was to break out of the Poprad Valley east of the High Tatra with the aim of advancing through Norway, No Sandes on Bochnia, west of Tarnov and taking the enemy at Krakow in the rear. Still further east, the Slovakian forces later released by OKH had to attack through the Dukla Pass, so well known from World War I days. One mountain division, a seasoned Bavarian formation, and two reserve divisions were allocated to this enveloping wing later on. Though 14th Army's initial battles, in particular those fought by 8th Silesian Corps for the Polish frontier fortifications, proved hard going, the issue in these frontier regions was virtually decided already from the operational point of view by the outflanking movement from the Carpathians. Admittedly, the proposed encirclement of the enemy grouping around Krakow did not come off in the literal sense as the enemy recognised the danger threatening him and duly evacuated western Galicia. But the bulk of his forces were still smashed in these first battles and the chase that followed in the course of which 22 Panzer Corps succeeded in overhauling its quarry. They took the army's right wing, the Mountain Corps and 17 Corps, as far as Lwów and the fortress of Prismis III, both of which were captured. The left wing, consisting of the Panzer Corps, 8 Corps and 7 Corps allocated to the army by the army group, was able to cross the San above its junction with the Vistula, and though our opponents fought back bravely in the subsequent battles, which were in part extremely heavy, further enemy forces, some of them coming from Warsaw, 